the state party should refrain from enacting legislation that would grant amnesty or pardon where torture is concerned, and it should ensure that all victims of torture and ill treatment obtain redress. Penny Mordaunt has only been the UK's Defence Secretary for three weeks, but she's already making a big impact. Her plan for a veteran amnesty has drawn warning from experts at the United Nations who are urging the UK not to adopt the law. Mordaunt has proposed shielding British military personnel from prosecution for any alleged crimes committed in Iraq, Afghanistan and elsewhere, as long as they happened more than 10 years ago. The one major exception would be for actions in Northern Ireland, to make sure the murders of UK citizens during the Troubles don't go unpunished. So, is there a double standard here? And does the law set a precedent that British soldiers overseas can evade justice? Well, joining me now to discuss this from Glasgow is Zoe Taylor. She's a Royal Air Force veteran who served in the military during the Troubles in Northern Ireland. And in London is human rights lawyer Shoaib Khan. Good to have you both on the program. So Zoe, we heard from the UN Committee Against Torture who say this is a bad idea. Amnesty International also says this is a bad idea. Human Rights Watch says this is a bad idea because they feel the spirit of this plan is that British soldiers should be above the law. They're right, aren't they? I think, I think they absolutely are right, yes. Um, however, I think we need to put this within historical context. Um, I think the British military, the modern British military of today is vastly different um, from, say, for instance, the uh, Northern Ireland conflict, which I believe the Home Secretary is actually trying to extend to 1968, mm -hmm. which will then um, encompass uh, Soldier F who would then be able to, if found guilty, um, serve a, a, a much shorter, quicker sentence and be pretty much in and out of prison. Um, but quite frankly, this tragedy just shouldn't be happening at all to this gentleman who is, you know, I believe suffering from a serious and um, life-limiting illness now in the twilight years of his age of 77 when he should be sharing it with his family okay. rather than being prosecuted and, I, I, and persecuted I, I, for right, a second time. Right. And I want to kind of come back to Northern Ireland and the Troubles in a moment. And Shreve, I'll come to you in a moment, but I just want to get some clarity from you, Zoe. Do you believe that, yes, there's presumption of innocence until proven guilty? Sure. But with this, for Afghanistan and Iraq, it's essentially saying our soldiers are innocent until proven well, nothing. Innocent, forever and ever, no matter what. That's essentially what they're saying. That, that shouldn't be the case, should it? No, I think, you know, there should always be um, proper and, and just um, investigations. And I think where a soldier has been proven to have deliberately and calculatedly commit what we would call as murder, which in the, which by definition is an act that's premeditated, I think then absolutely, I don't think there's any veteran in the country that wouldn't say that that was the right and just thing to do because they would be letting the side down. Mm -hmm. However, where there's examples of um, a soldier um, being caught up in a situation um, that has not been premeditated, could be an error of judgment, could be a human mistake, it could be because the person's maybe served two or three conflicts and really isn't in a position to be, or shouldn't rightfully be placed back into a further conflict due to mental health concerns. I think there's different circumstances and there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to all of this. I think every single case that comes up has to be taken at its right. own merits, but okay. the one thing that we should see is fair justice. Okay, so Shoaib Khan, statute of limitations, if it happened more than 10 years ago and there's no new evidence, there's no way that somebody can be prosecuted. Do you agree with that? Um, no, I don't agree with that. Um, obviously, the types of crimes, um, as Zoe said, that we're dealing with here, uh, mostly, I would say, 90%, 99% of cases are murder, um, i.e. death, killing someone, or torture. Um, and those are not crimes that should have statutes of limitations. Whenever um, we come to hear of them, whenever allegations are made, whenever someone feels they have been um, a family member of theirs was subjected to either of those, they should be investigated. Um, and the perpetrator, if it is proven, 
um, as you said, innocent and proven guilty, of course. That applies to everyone, including soldiers. Um, if they are proven to be guilty, they should be punished according to the situation. What we don't need um, are, are, as you said, double standards. Um, what we don't need is a completely separate law just for soldiers um, and a separate law for anyone else. Um, if a murder is committed, whether, in the, uh, whether on the battlefield or elsewhere, um, it has to go punished. When we talk about murder, obviously we talk about um, unlawful killing. We're not talking about someone who um, dies fighting our forces. So if uh, um, uh, a UK soldier, British soldier, um, breaches the law, breaches human rights, law, breaches international humanitarian mm -hmm. law, international law, um, and kills someone, then they have to be answerable for that. They okay. have to be accountable, so, however sure. long ago so that was. Let me, let me quote to you a Ministry of Defense spokeswoman who said, we are not proposing an amnesty. Our package of measures focused on overseas military operations will help avoid service personnel and veterans being subject to legal proceedings many years after the events in question where there is no new evidence. Wrongdoing in the armed forces will always be investigated in line with our legal and international obligations. Is that just boilerplate sort of PR or is there some value in that statement? Are, are you maybe reconsidering your opposition to it after hearing that? <laughs> no, I'm not. I, I mean, as you said, I mean, uh, what, what the government is suggesting or has suggested thus far is very vague. We don't know exactly what they're suggesting. Um, all we know is about one of the statute of limitations, a 10-year rule that they seem to be bringing in. Um, but the point is, even where we have seen, for instance, um, victims of Iraq, um, th there were many that, ha would, that have been found to have been unlawfully killed and tortured. The UK government has paid out millions in compensation to them. So obviously, those r crimes were committed, which is why the government paid out that much millions of taxpayers' money. Right. And one assumes they didn't just pay them out just because right. claims were made. Um, in terms of the 10 years limit, of course, there are cases, Afghanistan, Iraq, that are still continuing, but they continue because the government drags its heels, because the government doesn't set up the correct procedures in the first place, because it doesn't involve an independent judge, because it doesn't deal with the situation um, in a way that that the European Convention on Human Rights uh, mandates it should. Um, it doesn't deal with the, the, the situation um, in, in a way that the law prescribes it should, which is why it will conduct some sort of court-martial, some sort of internal inquiry, something to try to sweep it under the carpet. Then the victims, alleged victims at that stage, have to keep fighting and say, look, we need right. a proper inquiry. Okay. Then, you know, decades later, we're like with Northern Ireland, we're de right. decades later, and those things haven't been um, resolved yet. Right. So, so no, however long the government right. takes, it shouldn't delay things. But if it does take more than 10 years, the victims still deserve a fair hearing. Right, Zoe, something that Theresa May supports, unlike with Iraq and Afghanistan, something that she would support is that if it can be proven that a British soldier did something unspeakably terrible in the late 60s or the 70s or the 80s or the early 90s, then they should be prosecuted. Now, you have a problem with that. Tell me why. I do. Um, because at the end of the day, it's all very fitting for, you know, soldiers on the ground to be um, hounded in the twilight years of their life at times when they've served their country and they should now be able to, you know, enjoy the rest of their life with their families um, to be the ones which are singled out. It's too easy to pick on a soldier. It's too easy to do that. It, they're easy to find and they're easy to handle. It's not so easy to find a terrorist. It's not so easy to find a politician or a general or a senior leader that may well have given those orders. How many senior leaders have we actually seen being prosecuted? And that's a rather fair point. And that's a fair ground? point. A lot of people These... say, certainly, a lot of people will say, well, Tony Blair or, or Bush should be, you know, in The Hague for Iraq, not soldiers, right? Fair enough. But do you at least understand your prime minister not wanting to um, open up this tinderbox, you have Brexit, you have trouble with the border, you have things flaring up, the, <laughs> the, the new IRA uh, claiming attacks, and now you want to delve into Northern Ireland again, right, and protect people who possibly committed terrible crimes. The Prime Minister's right here politically because she's avoiding massive trouble on the street, isn't she, Zoe? Well, I mean, you know, there's only one way for, you know, Northern Ireland really to, to sort of res resolve itself. And like you say, it is still ongoing and it's more prevalent than the sort of the British press 
would have us believe. Um, and that's for all of the sides to come back together and try to you know, resolve the past. Now, if things happened in the past, and I don't for one minute believe that, that our soldiers deliberately went, went out to murder people, I think mistakes were possibly made given today's current context. But in the context of 1968, where the mm. world was very different, for heaven's sakes, I actually wasn't even born in 1968, but where the world was entirely different, and make no mistakes, those soldiers on the ground, you know, if they would easily have been murdered in the same way that the, the, the two um, undercover agents in the car were murdered when they were monitoring a funeral, you know, absolutely brutal, brutal times. So, uh, no, I think it's just too... It, right. British forces have long been political pawns, okay. and okay. they still are political pawns. OK, just enough time to get a response from Shuaib. In the context of the decision over Northern Ireland, especially with what Theresa May has pushed back with, what's your take, Shuaib? Um, well, firstly, I mean, d just the way that Theresa May puts it, um, unsurprisingly, is just ridiculous and the wrong way around. What she seems to say, you know, the way you quoted her, um, and those, uh, I think, are her words, that where it's proven someone's committed a heinous crime, to paraphrase her, um, then they should be uh, um, prosecuted or investigated. I think that's completely the wrong way around. First you investigate someone, then you prove them guilty. Um, how are you supposed to find someone who's provenly guilty and then prosecute them? The point is, everyone's innocent until they're proven guilty. So any times any allegation is mm -hmm. made, we're not going to know if they're actually guilty or not until we prosecute them, until we investigate them. And unfortunately, that requires them to be standing in the dock, that requires them to attend court, that requires them to give their evidence, their side of the story. Um, one thing that Zoe said, which I do support, and I think our criminal law itself, even civil crim uh, criminal law, should take account of, is someone's mental health, is someone's age, is someone's infirmity, is someone's illness, uh, is someone's disability. And criminal law takes regard of that anyway. Um, we have seen recently, for instance, all the sexual offences and so on, um, cases being revived from the 70s and 80s. Obviously, many of those men, um, many of those people, um, are in the 70s and 80s now. Does it mean that we just they, they should just be immune from the law because in their 70s? No. But what it might mean is, if a 30-year-old was prosecuted for the same thing, found guilty, he goes to prison for 10 years, maybe a 70-year-old goes for five years. Obviously, we can reflect that in the sentence, but it doesn't mean right. they should go scot-free. Okay. Zoe and Shoaib, I wish we had more time, but we do not. It's been good to talk to both of you. I thank you very much for joining us on The Newsmakers.